Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1992 dark comedy, Death Becomes Her. Now, this is one of my favorite comedies, despite the fact that it's not laugh-out-loud hilarious consistently throughout. Some of the jokes fall flat. It's one of my favorites because of how enjoyable and how entertaining it is. It's a really nice mix of of horror, comedy, and uh, just overall zaniness. It has a really good tone. It really does mix the darkness uh, along with some genuine moments of light fairly well. Uh, it also has a surprisingly good amount of heart to it, especially uh, with the film's last few sequences that really uh, culminate and kind of... Uh, add things all up together and it's just so much fun to watch Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn go at each other's throats uh, for the entirety of, of the film for the most part just really such a blast to see those two legendary actresses just completely uh, throw caution to the wind and just embrace such a over-the-top and uh, crazy kind of film. Uh, the film was directed by Robert Zemeckis, and uh, this is honestly my second favorite film of his after Back to the Future. And it really is one of those movies that you can tell he had a blast doing this, that he absolutely was 100% behind this film. Because... In a lot of ways, it matches the sensibilities and the tone and the overall vibe of Tales from the Crypt. That's why a lot of people look at it as an unofficial Tales from the Crypt film. And I can see why. you got the star-studded cast. you got Robert Zemeckis' involvement. You've got uh, the same kind of tone and vibe that you would see in, in a Tales from the Crypt episode. Uh, you got the high production values. Uh, and... In a lot of ways, the structure of the story and the way things are set up are very EC Comics-like in terms of the characters and their comeuppance and so on and so forth. So that is something that goes a long way for me and my my personal taste because I love Tales from the Crypt. So when you manage to nail that dynamic, you've got a good film. You've got a great film. Uh, that is just a great time at the movies. But it's not just the vibe and the tone that Zemeckis does a good job with. He directed the hell out of this movie. From getting the most out of his actors and his actresses to the most out of the visual effects. He's one of the uh, directors that, in his prime, was one of the best directors when it comes to working with visual effects. When it comes to really making the visual effects stand out and really just pop off the screen in a, in a very dynamic and, and genuinely stunning way. Uh, the film won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects uh, in 1992 for a very good reason. Uh, I still feel for the most part the majority of these effects, which were groundbreaking for the time, incorporating CGI in ways that had never been seen before, uh, still hold up really well. There are some moments where you can kind of see uh, the limitations of what they were working with, but for the most part, it still is a very effective film when it comes to its visual effects. And I just feel that Zemeckis just really injected a lot of passion into the film, and the fact that he was such an established and already talented and veteran filmmaker he was able to really play around with the camera work and with the techniques and to create some really fun, uh, just great moments of, of uh, direction with tracking shots and zooms and pans and so on and so forth. But as good as Zemeckis' direction is in this film, this movie is, in a lot of ways, nothing without its screenplay by uh, Martin Donovan and David Coep. Uh, there have been rumors that this was intended to be a Tales from the Crypt film. Those are just rumors because uh, Martin Donovan and David Coep wrote this uh, script and 
they were shopping it around for many, many years before this eventually did get made. Uh, it was initially intended to maybe be more of a low budget independent film and uh, more of a straight up horror movie. And then they uh, played around with things some more and just decided to inject uh, some more comedy into it and satire of Hollywood and and uh, celebrities and and just uh, superficial uh, people in general. And they created a screenplay that is just one of the most witty and and brilliant scripts of of its era. And it really takes the whole fountain of the fountain of youth myth and puts a, a new spin on it and the, you have a lot of sardonic moments you have a lot of macabre humor and you have a lot of stuff that really is is quite clever when it comes to the overall plot uh the screenplay wound up on the uh desk or in the lap of robert zemeckis uh and the rest is history he fell in love with it he loved it and uh, and he said I'm, i want to do it so that's what got the script on the fast track. And that's what also brought in cast members like Meryl Streep and Goldie Hawn and Bruce Willis into the fold. And that's what gave the film's uh, production uh, a pretty uh, sizable budget to really effectively create exquisite uh, visuals in terms of the production and art design and costuming and, and the visual effects. And... Um, it's one of those films that I definitely feel the bigger budget benefited it because you're able to go as over the top and gaudy as humanly possible with the production and art design of, uh, of, of, of Madeline uh, Ashton's mansion or, or Liesel's uh, creepy uh, mansion that is featured quite prominently in the film's uh, climax. And, uh, really play around with things in terms of uh, makeup effects and, and visual effects and so on and so forth. Um, and get composers like Alan Silvestri on board to do the score, uh, which I honestly feel this is one of his best scores. I really like this score uh, for Death Becomes Her. It fits the film perfectly and it, it just really captures the overall heart and 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 vibe of the film so well and it enhances numerous different sequences uh with uh its insertion um and yeah the script i just i just love the witty retorts the barbs the backbiting the the back and forth between uh helen and madeline it is such an enjoyable romp to see these two just claw each other to shreds and I like the fact that by the end of the movie, it kind of shifts. The dynamic shifts between the two. They kiss and make up, and now they are, uh, in a lot of ways, even more villainous. And then your main protagonist is now Bruce Willis's character, uh, who, you know, he, uh, Ernest, who is the henpecked husband, who spends majority of the movie being a pathetic drunk and throughout the course of the film he gains courage and he finally breaks away from these two abusive women and uh creates a life of his own and in a lot of ways finds the real uh source of immortality and i thought the way that they handled that was really uh great it was a great message really nice heartfelt way to end the movie but even despite you know the whole thing about how he found the uh he finally found uh a mortal immortality you know uh a way to live forever through you know the his grandkids and his grandkids children you know or his children's children and and through his his uh good deeds and so on and so forth but even by the end of the movie, it still ends in such a dark, just twisted fashion with Helen and Madeline just literally in pieces. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's uh, quite a spectacle in numerous different ways. Uh, and uh, it, it's quite a, a legitimate treat. It really is. It's a terrific film with a terrific cast. I mean, Goldie Hawn... 
at her peak of just pure sexiness and just sex appeal and charisma as Helen Sharp. Meryl Streep as Madeline Ashton. Just this really despicable Corella DeVille kind of uh, bitch uh, from hell. And it was really fun to see uh, Meryl Streep step out way outside of her comfort zone with this particular film and with this role. It's my favorite performance and my favorite film of hers as a result because it's so wildly different than what she normally uh, does as an actress. And, and it's also one of my favorite Bruce Willis uh, uh, performances. His performance in this is one of his best acting uh, jobs because it's another instance of somebody really going out there and doing something that is very abnormal uh, compared to uh, their normal uh, acting fare. Uh, Bruce Willis uh, shows his acting skills and, and really just shows off his acting muscles in this particular film with his role as Ernest because it shows he can play a henpecked husband who's an alcoholic and a total loser and he's not just a guy who can only play action heroes and badasses or or comedic foils he can actually be a character that has this kind of depth to him i mean and his line delivery his exasperated uh cries of oh boy oh boy or are just hilarious and and i just i just love so many scenes with bruce willis in this movie uh, and Bruce Willis is one of those actors that you never would think would be able to be pull this off. You wouldn't you. And also you wouldn't think that you would cast him in a role like this. So it's so refreshing to see him do a role like this and just pull it off to such degree. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite scenes in the movie <laughs> that just cracks me up every time I think about it is when when Ernest, he he realizes that uh, Madeline has been taken to the morgue, and it, he he's you know he's he's upset and and uh, the 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 nurse is trying to calm him down. He's like you know hey it happens you know da 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 trying to console him, and he's all like the morgue, she'll be furious. <laughs> It's just Bruce Willis says that line better than I ever could, but it's just it's so fucking funny and hilarious because of just the, the absurdity of it, um, and and the whole sequence before that with the doctor and he's doing the examination on, on Madeline and he's like, does this hurt? Does this bending her her wrist like all the way back? And she's like, nah, nah, it doesn't it doesn't hurt, you know. Uh, and then he takes a look at her neck and it's all like shattered in two places. And he's like, oh my God. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in this. Some really wonderful bits of satire of Hollywood and uh, just the superficial nature of, of Hollywood and and uh, Beverly Hills and, and plastic surgery and, and the obsession with uh, wanting to look and remain young and uh, there's just a lot of great moments and just really just great uh, bits of visual effects. I mean, the, the shot of Goldie Hawn with a hole in her chest is one of the best looking effects uh, out there. It is so well done. It still holds up remarkably well after all of these years. And even does some of the other work uh, in the film with... Uh, Madeline with uh, with uh, Meryl Streep's character and, and, and all the various different uh, disfigurations and, and uh, injuries that she she is uh, I'm trying to think of the right word not necessarily succumb to but uh, all the all the different uh, injuries that she accrues throughout the uh, majority of the movie um but yeah the film like i said i can i cannot sing enough praises about the cast goldie hawn meryl streep bruce willis even isabella rossellini as liesel 
Um, and apparently there were some, there were some alternate kind of ideas for casting. Uh, actually Kevin Klein was cast in the Bruce Willis role of Ernest, but he dropped out and Jeff Bridges auditioned for it, but he didn't get the role. So eventually Bruce Willis got it and, and Kevin Klein probably would have done a good job, but I'm really glad that fate would come into play and Bruce Willis would get the role. I don't, I don't think I would really like the film or, or really love it as much as I do if Bruce Willis wasn't playing against type in this film as Ernest. And, uh, there's also, there was a rumored, uh, not necessarily rumored, but like she was in the running for Helen, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, but eventually the role went to Goldie Hawn and that worked out better because this really needed, Helen needed somebody who could really nail the comedic aspect of the character and uh needed to have a lot of charisma and I don't I don't really view Jennifer Jason Lee as that kind of actress or that kind of uh uh person who could really pull off that kind of personality. Uh it was also a really fun uh moment uh for Goldie Hawn to really stretch her own acting muscles to play this uh deranged uh former friend of Madeline's who f goes off the edge because uh, Madeline stole another boyfriend from her and Goldie Hawn gets to play around in a fat suit and, and just really play things to the hilt and, and be deranged and crazy and she really relished that opportunity uh, and uh, it definitely does show now the film also features some really excellent editing by Arthur Smith and, uh, of course, uh, gorgeous cinematography by Dean Cundey. And uh, the film goes by at a pretty decent pace. It does have some pacing issues. Uh, in fact, that's the reason why a lot of the scenes, there were a lot of scenes that were deleted, were due to these pacing issues. Uh, the director, Robert Zemeckis himself, even realized that. And he cut out a lot of scenes from the film uh, before it was uh, initially given its uh, final cut because of these pacing issues. And some of the jokes don't quite land. Uh, most of them do. Uh, and But some don't. And that's kind of how it is for, for a lot of comedies. But there's a lot of jokes and there's a lot of things that are thrown out there. So some of them don't really play out very well. Like the floating nuns down the hallway. What the hell was that about? Apparently there was more to that, but the scene was deleted. Um, there was also a whole subplot that was cut out of the film dealing with a character, uh, who I guess was initially some kind of, uh, love interest for Ernest, uh, that was played by Tracy Ullman. And that was completely cut from the film. In fact, there's there's some interesting bits of trivia about the uh, deleted scenes. Um, there's a lot of alternate sort of lines of dialogue and other uh, comedic bits that were in the trailer, but weren't actually featured in the finished film. And uh, there was a whole different ending. The original ending involved Tracy Ullman's character, Tony, helping Ernest in a ruse of faking his own death in order to get away from Madeline, Helen, and Liesel. Uh, the plan worked, and the two end up running away to Europe to start a new life together. Many years later, Madeline and Helen, both parodies of their former selves, with cracked peeling paint and putty covering most of their gray and rotting flesh, are on vacation in Switzerland, yet they are completely bored and miserable. They notice an elderly couple being affectionate, and they become envious of them. As the couple gets into a car and drives away, Madeline and Helen realize it's Ernest and Tony and chase after them only to be hit by an oncoming car and break into pieces similar to the theatrical ending. This is why you have uh, a, a, a uh, elderly Bruce Willis uh, and featured at least in a photo at the, at, in the end of the movie because they actually did make up Bruce Willis for that particular ending and then they uh, photoshopped or... or did the pseudo version of Photoshop 
and put that on on a different body for for the for the shot for the funeral at the end of the film um that explains some things about why some there were parts of the film that feels like they're missing i guess uh there were some other things that were cut for instance the stuff with the uh the nuns apparently uh, when Ernest enters the hospital's uh, morgue in search of Madeline, there was a drawer that uh, contained the body of a priest that suddenly rolls out at one point. So the nuns were supposed to view the priest's body, and uh, that's why they were there. And that explains why they're, they were uh, then floating, crying uh, in a later sequence. And it makes it so it's not just pure randomness. Um I can see why maybe they kept that in just to kind of be kind of zany and, and over the top and weird, but it doesn't really work because it's just too out there and too random. Um, but yeah, I would have loved to have seen those deleted scenes and I know I'm not the only one. A lot of fans of this film have been waiting to see them and uh, Universal dropped the ball or, or maybe just dropped them entirely and they were left on the cutting room floor and they deteriorated and they're nowhere to be found because uh, they didn't show up on this Blu-ray. In fact, they've never shown up. I don't even know if they're even in the TV version of the movie. Um, but I know that uh, there was a lot that was cut out of the film. Uh, there's a 25-minute uh, documentary, not really documentary, it's more of a series of interviews with Zemeckis and uh, Dean Cundy and uh, the director of photography, uh, the writer David Coop, uh, special effects artist Lance Anderson and David Anderson, and the production designer Rick Carter. And it's interesting, but it doesn't really provide a whole lot of new information. There's a vintage making of featurette which features more of these scenes that were eventually cut from the film, and there's also the theatrical trailer. Um, this is worth picking up if you're a fan of the movie because this is the best transfer that uh, there is for this movie right now. Uh, the DVD was notorious for being piss poor. Uh, so bad that a lot of fans were petitioning uh, Universal to remaster the film. Um, it wasn't even in widescreen. So this is actually the first time I ever got to see the film and it's an initial intended uh, format in uh 16 by 9 uh widescreen uh so it, it was it was like watching the movie all over again because uh, i was really able to just be enraptured by the visuals and just the the film even more uh with uh with the with the new uh dazzling transfer and uh in its an initial intended uh format and, and uh aspect ratio now I know some people have said that this isn't that good of a transfer. I don't know what they're talking about. This transfer looks good. It looks great. I, I don't understand. I mean, for a film this old from 1992, it's got a fair amount of grain. It doesn't look like it's DNR'd to death or anything. I think it's a I think it's a great looking transfer, and I'm a huge fan of this film. So I don't really get the criticisms of how this transfer is is bad or barely better than the DVD. This this is an enormous upgrade over the DVD. It's not even close. Um, I don't really know what else to say about the movie, uh, except I would recommend it. If you haven't seen the film, it's a really fun movie with uh, fun performances and dazzling special effects and a lot of genuine bits of high style and... It's just a really unique and wonderful film in a lot of ways, uh, despite how despicable and, and dark it is. Um, but yeah, uh, that's my thoughts and my review of Death Becomes Her. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. See ya.